They say this is a big rich town, yeah. I just come from the poet's part. Bright light, city lights, I gotta make it. Hey everybody, it's Emma Monet, and welcome back to my channel. On today's video, we'll be discussing all things Power Book 2 Ghost. Season 1, Episode 3. Play the game. This episode open up and we see Kane and Drew going around the neighborhood collecting their money. They get to a corner store and the owner does not have his cut. Kane instantly attacks him and Drew has to pull him off of him. This shows us here the dynamic between Kane and Drew. Kane is clearly the muscle. Next we see Diana getting a text from Tyreek asking if he can come over to thank her and her mom for getting what he needed to Tasha as Drew and Kane come in the house. They're sitting talking and Diana sees a new character on live flexing, doing the most, making it hot out here. The three kids are sitting there discussing what they think they should do when Monet walks in. Monet is clearly pissed and Diana knows it's not a good time to try to invite Tyreek over. So she just tells him that she'll see him tomorrow at Zeke's game. Now we're back at the MCC and we see Tasha meeting with Davis. Davis is fed up with Tasha at this point. He is sick of, and I quote, Her line Tasha then tries to tell Davis that she knows that she can convince a jury that she's innocent and that she wants to be put on the stand. Paula obviously doesn't think that it's a good idea to put Tasha on the stand, but Davis has a trick up his sleeve. This nigga Tyree cannot be on time to save his life, y'all. He is walking into canonical studies late again. Professor Simmons is having his lecture and he calls him out in front of everybody. Professor Simmons asks for Tyreek's take on the book. He then tells Tyreek that he has a remedial response and he doesn't believe that he should be in the class. Y'all, he lucky went in on him. During Tyreek's explanation of the book, he talks about virtue being in the eye of the beholder. And I love how they make all of his canonical studies work mirror his real life. Professor Jabari Reynolds is in the background watching and listening and he kind of like smirking and you'll see why later. After class, Tyreek stops and talks to Lauren, and she basically tells him that he needs to do and say whatever the professors want so that he can pass. Then it is also revealed that Lauren has a brother who went to rehab. It seems like we're gonna start finding out a little bit more about Lauren. I wonder what kind of past Lauren has. As Tyreek walks away from Lauren, we see him texting Brayden and asking him if he's still down to make some money. I know what time it is. We see Tasha back at the MCC and she delivers the Plan B pill to the inmate, Layla. While Tasha is sitting talking to Layla about becoming friends, we see a man fixing something with his camera out recording Tasha. Tasha then sees the guard that Layla has some sort of relationship with in there and she gets up and walks away. She was even walking like she was a prisoner. I was like, girl, why you, why you walking like that? <laughs> we are now introduced to Lorenzo. He is in jail living large. To find out that the man that was recording Tasha is Lorenzo's flunky. While Lorenzo is sitting there talking, he gets a call from Monet. And she is telling him about their situation with Lil Guap. Lorenzo refuses to let anything happen to Lil Guap because apparently Lil Guap's father took a bullet for Lorenzo. He tells Monet to have Drew go and handle it. Monet doesn't want Drew to go handle it because she knows that he won't handle it the right way and she wants to send Kane. Lorenzo ain't hearing that and he said, do as I say and do it now. Monet goes to tell her kids about their plan to deal with Lil Guap. When she told them that Drew was going to go handle it, they was all shocked. Diana and Drew leave out of the kitchen and Kane stays behind and she tells Kane to follow Drew. Monet clearly knows that Drew is not about that life like Kane is. Back at school, Tyreek is working on his own homework when Zeke walks in and sets down a book and tells him he has a paper due the day after tomorrow. Nigga. Tyreek is pissed, obviously, because he has his own work to do. Zeke playing around, talking about how busy he is, talking about he ain't got time to do it, talking about how he got a game the next day. Well, you're not getting about that warm-up suit, so what's the point? So he says to make up for him, giving him the assignment last minute, he wants him to hit up his Aunt Monet so that he can ask her permission to date Diana. But he cannot say what he really wants to Zeke. Zeke then tells Tyreek that his Aunt Monet told him that he needs to keep his school life and his family life separately. Back at the prison, we see Tasha being taken from her cell and getting ready for trial. 
As far as she knows, she's going to regular trial. We see her getting glammed up and looking like the Tasha that we used to know. She got her beat done. She got her wig back on. She got her little suit on looking like mother of the year. She gets to court and then soon finds out that this is a mock trial. She wanted to be put on the stand so bad and Davis wants to prove to her that she is not ready. Everybody there has signed non-disclosure agreements so none of the case details will get out. The major thing is Tasha is paying for everybody to be there and mock trials are really expensive. So that's just putting more pressure on Tyreek to come up with this money to pay Davis. Back at the school, we see Tyreek meet up with Brayden and we find out that Brayden went to the doctor to steal a prescription pad. They're going to write fake scripts and go out of the state and fill them. Now back at Tasha's mock trial, she's on the stand and she is being examined by Davis. She seemingly has the jury eating out of her hand as she talks about how her and James met and stories of their past and then the story of when everything went bad. She talks about how James made her put a gun up her dress when she was pregnant with the twins, Tyreek and Raina. She talks about how she did everything out of fear and that James was the boss. She's sitting back with a little smirk on her face looking like she really just won her trial. She is in over her head, okay? She don't even know what's in store for her. Diana and Monet are heading inside of Zeke's basketball game when Diana is discussing her hoop dreams. Come to find out, Diana also wants to play professional basketball. And Monet tells her that her place is in the family. Her being a professional basketball player doesn't help the family at all, only bringing in 75 bands a year. Diana doesn't want to do things to help the family. She wants to do things to help herself. And you can tell from their conversation that Diana is definitely a daddy's girl and Monet is fed up. Throughout this entire episode, you can tell Monet is upset that her kids don't respect her as much as they respect her father, although she's the one out there handling business and taking care of the family. Diana brings up Tyreek while talking to her mother and Monet tells her that she had Ramirez, Mr. Officer, look into Tyreek and everybody that hangs around Tyreek either ends up dead or in jail, so she needs to keep him away from her. Inside the locker room, we can tell that Zeke is ready to get back on the court. Zeke asks his coach if he can go warm up and he lets him know that's against regulation until he is off of academic probation. Zeke just wants to get out there and remind the people that he is still there. So the coach does tell him that he can make a statement. Zeke doesn't want to get in front of the cameras, but the coach tells him if he has any intention on going pro, he better get used to it now. Outside, Zeke sees Diana and Monet walking up to the stadium to watch the game, and he walks over and thanks them for helping him with his mother. He is real short with him and then ignores him when he even asks to sit with them at the game. Diana pulls Tyreek to the side and lets him know that some people that they're working with are acting up and it's causing her to have an attitude with any and everybody. Tyreek's mind is his opening. He's like, oh, some people they working with acting up? Cool. He tries to give Diana some advice on how to deal with her mother. Then he tells her that he has to go write his paper so he'll catch her later. Diana sees her mother having a conversation and takes that as her cue to pull out her trap phone and makes a call to Poppy. Back at the dorms, we see Epiphany pull up on who we find out to be Scott. There's a party that night and Scott is the drug dealer on campus and they needed him to be distracted and away from the party so that they could get in with their product and become the new dealers on campus. Epiphany shows up and acts like she's there as a birthday surprise for Scott and handcuffs him to a pole and then just gets on the phone and starts chatting with her boyfriend. Scott thought that he was about to get some chocolate delight that night. I honestly thought she was gonna do something terrible to him. With the way this show going, I, I thought something bad was gonna happen. Somebody's gonna get shot or a was gonna get split something, y'all. I ain't gonna lie. So we see Drew walking down an alley and he is walking up to the GTG party where Lil Guap is. And we can clearly see that Lil Guap is a dummy. He didn't know where it's like hospitality and inconsiderate. He got his girl there helping him try to figure out what he's trying to say. Y'all, he is clearly a little dummy. Lil Guap is already like, hey, this ain't even your scene, so what you doing in here? And Drew tries to ease us into the conversation and at first tries to say that Monet sent him there to let him know how good he's killing it for the organization. And then tries to throw in that he needs to chill on all the internet shit. Clearly Lil Guap is feeling himself and he doesn't respect Drew, so he ain't hearing that. So to try to exert his dominance over Drew, he gets on live anyway and then tries to put Drew on live too. Drew smacks the phone out of his hand. Lil Guap says, Your mom's on my dick cause she ain't had none in over a decade. Drew hopped up and got his hand on his gun. Lil Guap asks, What you gonna do nigga? And all you hear is Kane in the cut. Nothing. Y'all he was sounding like Kane in that mug. I was like oh my god. Yeah, it was like the Grim Reaper walked in that mug. You can clearly 
clearly see the blatant disrespect that Lil Guap was giving Drew because he hold up immediately when he realized Kane was in there. He didn't want no beef. You don't want no problems, problems. <laughs> Drew ends up taking Lil Guap's phone and it looks like they're gonna be able to walk out peacefully. But Kane just gotta be Kane and shoots up the party. Walking out of the party down the alley, Drew is pissed and he's trying to figure out why Kane is even there. Kane lets him know that Monet told him to follow him. As they walk out of the alley, a squad car pulls up y'all and they get two foot nicked. So we see that Ramirez is the cop that is driving the car. There's another white officer who gets out and starts chasing them on foot. You can tell that he's afraid and he probably even knows who Kane and Drew are. And Kane is getting ready to off the police officer y'all and I really thought that it was about to happen because we know Kane is not reserved at all. While Drew over there is shaking in his boots, Ramirez pulls up and yells for the other officer to come on. And you can tell that the officer hesitated and was like, Some ain't right. But he ended up going with Ramirez. I think his partner knows that he's dirty. But luckily for him, Ramirez saved his life, little do we know. Back at Zeke's game, he is giving his statement after the press conference. And Zeke opens his big mouth and says that he'll be back for the next game. Boy. And Monet just like, yeah, baby, uh -huh, yeah, that's my baby, wall. Coach know he lying, and the coach is like, no further comment. After Zeke's game, Ramirez is at Monet's house telling her about the incident with Kane, Drew, and Lil Guap. Come to find out, the police have been watching Lil Guap's lives and have been keeping patrol cars in the area. They saw Lil Guap's live and saw Drew's jacket in it, and he tells Monet that she needs to put her business on hold, and if not, she needs to lay low. She just kisses him deeply to make him forget about what they're talking about and then initiate sex. While Ramirez is trying to get his work clothes, Lorenzo texts her and tells her that she needs to come see him the next day. Back at the dorms, Tyreek and Brayden are sitting out counting their money that they made from the party, and clearly they made a killing, but they still need more. Now it's time for Tasha to be cross-examined during her mock trial. None other than Tamika is there to do it. Y'all, Tamika told Tasha down on that stand. Y'all, she made me feel like I was guilty. She made me feel like I committed these crimes. She made me feel like I was on trial. She was throwing jazz too, making little comments about Tasha here, up there talking about ghosts with Angela's man. Y'all, she was going in on her. But she definitely gave him a good depiction of how Tasha would get broke down on the stand. She was too confident, and Tamika humbled her ass real quick. Boy, boy, Tasha, you going down. After the trial is concluded, we find out that all 12 jurors found Tasha to be guilty. Tasha can't believe it. Even the women. Paula tells her if she doesn't start telling the truth, that jail outfit is going to be the last outfit she ever wears. Tamika is back in the mock courtroom talking to Davis and tells him that he needs to get down on his hands and knees and go to sex and beg for a plea deal for Tasha. It's her to join the team. Why can't we become the black dream team? Tamika is not about that. And Davis clearly has been doing his homework because him and Paula found the waiver so that Tamika could represent Tasha in court. At this point, Davis is ready to double down and go all in. Now we see Monet and Lorenzo in bed after their conjugal visit. They're laying talking about the kids and the business and Lorenzo lets Monet know that it's not working out the way she's running it. She tells him it could work out if he just lets her do what she needs to do because she knows those kids better than him. He is mad because she disobeyed him and she has to let that nigga know that she ain't one of the kids, she has a wife. Okay, at this point, we also find out that Lorenzo wants Drew to take over the business when Monet can't anymore. He thinks Kane is too unpredictable and she's too attached to Diana. Monet clearly wants Kane to run the business, but Lorenzo obviously has other plans. Back at the school, we see Tyreek entering his canonical studies and he's sitting up talking to Lauren, being all flirty with her, and they find their papers that they had written the other day. Tyreek opens his and finds out that he didn't get any credit. He approaches Professor Simmons about his no credit and Professor Simmons tells him that grading papers is beneath him. Professor Reynolds graded his paper. He is really starting to get on my nerves, y'all. As Tyreek is going to meet with Professor Reynolds, we see Professor Reynolds making a call to Carrie, Professor Milgram, and leaving a message on her voicemail. Clearly, he's been trying to get in contact with her and she's been ignoring him like her sponsor told her to. Tyreek goes into his office and asks him why he didn't give him credit. And Professor Reynolds basically lets him know that he didn't give him credit because he didn't stay true to his opinion. Professor Reynolds is irritating, y'all. I think I get what he's trying to do, but at the same time, it's like, boy, you doing more harm than good at this point. What's your beef? 
Monet comes back from visiting Lorenzo and she walks in the house pissed. Don't leave her acting like she's sweet. She is pissed about the GTG shooting. Ramirez was the one to tell Monet about the shooting and even Lorenzo knew before Kane and Drew even spoke up about it. She gets on Diana's case about her calling her daddy because while she was visiting with Lorenzo, he brought up Diana going back to school. Tyreek gets back to the dorm and Zeke is just sitting there playing the video game, y'all. Tyreek is pissed because he just failed one of his own papers trying to help Zeke. Zeke like, nigga, what they got to do with me? You know the arrangement. And Tyreek like, um. Did you ever think about the fact that if I fell out, that this arrangement won't be no more regardless, dummy? So he tells him that he gonna have to start pulling some of his own way and start doing some of his own work. Zeke tries to apologize and Tyreek tells him, Sorry ain't gonna cut it no more, bruh. I need a favor and you ain't about to say no. Next scene is just another scene that make me dislike Professor Reynolds even more. Y'all already seen having a meeting with one of his grad students and she's talking about how she read his book, the book where he was talking about Carrie in it. He tries to say, oh no, I wasn't talking about a particular woman. It was a work of fiction and clearly the old girl is trying to push up on him. She is a fan, y'all. She's trying to get more than a, hey, she's trying to get a little bit ID. Indeed she got. Thinking they alone, but who's in the office? Carrie. Carrie came into the office to get some work done, heard the music playing, and was already kind of like, what's going on? But then she heard the young lady saying Jabari's name, and that's all it took. Y'all know that she's suffering from a love and sex addiction. That triggered her. She had to get up out of there. How many women have you banged in your office? Like, boy, like, he nasty, and I ain't seen him use the kind of man, one of these women. Oh, nasty ass. Somehow, some way, Monet figures out that Diana has her own burner and comes and smashes it. She is tired of these kids defying her and going behind her back and running to their daddy like he gonna do something. I think Monet is ready to lay down the law. Monet comes to pick Zeke up for their weekly dinner and we find out what favor Tyreek needed from him. Zeke lied and told Monet that Tyreek was out of the room so that she would come up and Tyreek could get a few minutes alone with her. She gives him five minutes and he hands her a bag of money. Monet like, Boy, I don't mean that I got enough money. Tyreek then tells her like, look, I get that Zeke is your priority, but my family is my priority. And if I fail out of here trying to take care of my family, then what you gonna do? That's good, Monet. And she tells him that if he plans on selling and if they're gonna work together, he can't be roommates with Zeke anymore. Tyreek is like, Ooh, I got somewhere to stay anyway. While they're talking, Tasha calls and she tells him to go ahead and take the call. Tasha calls to let Tyreek know that she's in trouble in court and that he needs to give Davis whatever he wants. Tyreek then lets Tasha know that he has a plan. Shit, I hope it's a good one, cause nigga, your mama going down. Tyreek then goes to move in with Brayden. Y'all know Brayden got a nice ass dorm because his family dinner on the campus. I do see that little stash spot coming a problem soon. And I could definitely see that Scott dude coming in there robbing them or something. After Monet gets back home, she's on the phone with Lorenzo, discussing Tyreek and how can they trust him. Monet knows that they can't trust him, but she does talk about how he is a weakness. She tells him that he needs to make a call. We then see Lorenzo calling Tasha in jail and letting her know that if she doesn't get Tyreek to do whatever they say, that they're gonna kill him. He also lets her know that Tyreek will be working for them now. I feel like this episode was to help move the storyline along. It wasn't nearly as much drama and action as the first two episodes had, but I feel like there was a lot of information given to us that is going to connect some dots later on in the Let's show. get right into this preview then, y'all. The preview opens up with Monet saying, We have a new business partner, Tariq St. Patrick. Then we see a clip of Sir Reynolds talking to Lauren and saying, We need someone who can represent Stansfield properly. Lauren is standing there with Tyreek, and I wonder what he could be talking about. Then we see Lauren talking to Tyreek and telling him, You're not the only one with secrets. And it seemed like Tyreek trying to be smooth and say, Well, how about we try? Then we see money being set down on the table, and it looks like it's Davis's hand in the background receiving it. We hear Tyreek saying, We about to open shop. And I think then we see a random guy holding some stacks of money. We see Tasha on the phone in jail saying, I know you're selling out there to pay Davis. You need to get a gun to protect yourself. Tasha is talking to Tyreek while he is walking through the snow. Then we see a clip of a gun. Then we see Tyreek opening the dorm room door. And who is it? Drew. Then we see a paper being slammed on a desk. It kind of looks like a woman's hand. So it could be Paula or Carrie. Hey y'all, Tate about to be in the next episode. Davis is sitting talking to Tate and says, This case is come back on you. And Tate is sitting there looking distraught. But we know Tate the Finesse got some of his sleeves. We see a clip of Tyreek running. I wonder what these niggas that into now. We see Tyreek kissing Diana. We see Brayden punching someone and it looks like Scott from the hair. And we hear Monet talking to Tyreek and saying, I can 
control anybody, Tyreek. When you know what someone wants, you can either give it to them or take it away. And the last clip of the preview shows Tasha being watched again by Lorenzo's flunky. What did y'all think of this week's episode, Play the Game? Let me know in the comments down below. And before you go, make sure you check out one of these other videos on my channel. And make sure you like, comment, and subscribe down below. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye. Before it goes down, yeah, I just happened to come apart. Legal one, baby, I